Good afternoon. Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Update on the CARES Act and Paycheck Protection Program. This is our fourth town hall uh, this month, and I am Eric Oskerson, one of the AICPA executives overseeing our CARES and PPP activities. We greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with you and share these, time, share these timely updates and information. It's never been more important to connect, so thanks for your time today. Before we get going, let me just cover a couple of housekeeping items. First off, you can earn CPE. You just need to collect 75% of these uh, pop-up boxes. And at the end of this webcast, you will be able to, you can click the CPE button uh, to get your certificate or after the event, a email be, will be sent to you and you can access it uh, in that fashion. A couple of other helpful hints. Uh, please do ask questions. We've got a, a great team here uh, answering your questions in real time, uh, both technical ones about the, the webcast uh, delivery. If you've, if you've got an issue, a technical issue, let us know what it is. And more importantly, we've got our firm team here that will be answering questions related to the CARES and PPP Act. So please bring them to us, and we will also look at uh, these questions and answer broad themes of them towards the end of today's session. We also have included a couple of uh, uh, download materials, uh, today's presentation, as well as our recommendation document for the PPP application and forgiveness process. So the presenters today are myself, Eric Ouskerson. I lead AICPA's business and technology subsidiary, CPA.com, and it's been a very, very active uh, time for us with all that's going on. With me is Mark Koziel, uh, who leads the firm area for the AICPA, and his team has been going nonstop. So welcome, Mark. Thanks, Eric. Looking forward to talking about new guidance. Thanks, Mark. And also with us is we've, we've, got, we've got a practitioner. We've got somebody who's out there in a, a G400 firm uh, supporting their clients and getting these, these applications submitted. Uh, this is Jan Lewis. Uh, she's also a member of our tax executive committee. She's been on AICPA Council. She's from Mississippi. She, she was uh, president of the Mississippi State Society. A lot of great experience. So, so welcome, Jan. I'm glad to be here, thanks. So today uh, we're gonna you know, cover a wide range of topics. It's been another very busy week, <laughs> a lot going on, a lot of new guidance, uh, a lot of issues that all of you are, are working through, and we're gonna try to talk about as many as possible. So I just wanna provide uh, some perspective on who we're getting a lot of this information from. Every single day, we are speaking with the governmental officials, uh, people at you know, Treasury, the SBA, the IRS, other policymakers. We're very, very active. We've probably been, never been more active in communication uh, with the 44,000 firms. You're bringing us many great insights. And we've also been collaborating with what we're calling the information providers here, the payroll processors that really are, are delivering this key data set they have really worked hard with us on some of these recommendations, and we are staying active in our dialogue uh, with the lenders, uh, with the leadership uh, for the, the banking community at ABA, and speaking with other uh, bank leader, leaders as well. So based on those discussions, we're bringing you our, our latest understanding of the act and of the guidance, and with that, we're also delivering some providing you some recommendations on how we see, you know, best to execute uh, areas that have not been, uh, you know, fully uh, prescribed via Treasury or, Treasury or SBA guidance. We have uh, been working closely with our coalition. We formed this small business co coalition over a month ago, and Paychex, ADP, Intuit, and, and Gusto, and many others have been giving us input on the different application uh, documents and calculations, as well as the forgiveness uh, calculations that we're working hard on right now. It's been a, a very, very uh, fast-paced month. Uh, we're now uh, just over a month since 
the CARES Act was signed into law. It went the the PPP application went live on April 3rd. So we haven't even been live for a month with the PPP process. And as we all know, the SBA E-Trans system opened back up on Monday after additional funds were approved. And you know, this week we've received more guidance. Uh, related to uh, the, the PPP process. So just so much going on. And what we've done here with this slide is just taking a step back and we're trying to you know, put what's happening into some major phases. You know, at the beginning of March, the pandemic you know, really hit uh, the world in the U.S. The businesses were shut down. Firms had to start working remotely. You know, that, that, that all, you know, processed rather quickly in the first couple of weeks of March. And then we started focusing on the business relief that was going to be put in place. And what the firms have been focused on in April is the eligibility for their clients and the application process, in particular related to the PPP program, but it's more than just the PPP program. And without a doubt, we are highly focused right now on forgiveness and compliance related to the PPP program, as well as other uh, elements of, of the CARES Act. But what we're also beginning to think about is the restart and recovery and how the firms are gonna help the business clients get back up and running. And there's gonna be an interconnection here between these different phases, because right now uh, people are, you know, businesses are looking at how do they bring their their employees back on payroll to maintain uh, the requirements uh, to re receive forgiveness on the loans. And there's issues such as uh, when, when they do fully start back up, how do they you know, produce the right workforce environment, supply chain adjustments, business model adjustments. So there's gonna be a lot of work in this restart and recovery. So that's something we will be talking about more in upcoming uh, town halls. But this town hall is going to still be focused on uh, the guidance that has recently come out, as well as a deeper dive into the forgiveness uh, recommendations that we just recently made. And we're also going to talk a little bit about some of the other elements of the, the CARES Act, such as the employee retention credit, and, and Jan will be leading us on that discussion. So Mark, uh, you and your team are the closest to all of the uh, ongoing guidance that's coming out of Treasury and the SBA. So why don't you uh, walk us through these next couple of slides? Thanks, Eric. Yeah, it has been what seems to be an incredibly busy week, but for uh, substantive changes or substantive guidance, we're still waiting. We'll talk about uh, the forgiveness calculation in a little bit. They're still focused on getting FAQs and rules out on the actual loan process, which seems crazy since many of you have already filed for the majority of your clients. you got to ask yourself who's left. Well, there's still a lot of small businesses out there who haven't filed yet. And in fact, in the last 24 hours, they only opened up uh, loan applications to, and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it were lenders below a billion dollars in assets. So they're trying to get to the smaller lenders now, giving them unique opportunity because the e-trans system just keeps taking on more and more weight with all of the, the, the volumes of applications that they're getting. So the application process is not over. They continue to issue uh, final rules and FAQs around it. You see here some, uh, some final rules that were distributed on the 24th of April. Uh, dealing with who's eligible and who's not based on probably a significant number of questions that they're getting. The private equity and the hedge funds, you know, that was happening early on. We were having a lot of interactions in those communities. They wanted in. They have a lot of small businesses and how they roll up and are the firms themselves eligible for it. And uh, they were clear in their in their final rule to say no. So, uh, just a lot happening with that. Probably more importantly is that last bullet, the limited safe harbor with respect to certification concerning uh, PPP. And I have to say, Eric, I know that you're getting uh, the calls. Our team is getting the calls. 
the state societies are getting the calls. It is everywhere about now a lot of companies saying, well, wait a minute, does this mean I shouldn't have taken a loan? And just a lot of nervousness around the fact of, of taking the, the loan and what self-assessment of need is. But I do think we have to go back to, uh, and is our treasury and SBA changing the rules? Yeah, probably a little bit. But, uh, you know, a lot of this public opinion has been dr- driving what some of these decisions are. And again, this thing is moving so darn fast uh, for everybody. Uh, and so, you know, I do think that there will be some level of leniency. Uh, but I think it's important for the, the firm and the, the individual CPA to understand and to talk to their client about what that means means what did it mean when they said that due to economic uncertainty uh their operations have been affected and therefore they they need the ppp loan and so there's been a lot of interpretations about that individually they're trying to clean up a little bit of that with uh, some of these faqs that they're doing uh we'll talk about a couple more of those but you know in general what we talk about uh, is first and foremost, what information is available? And I should say, and I think I said it last week, Eric, uh, that you know, you and Barry Melanson, our CEO, recorded a fantastic video on April 10th. It's available on AICPA TV. And then you cut that up specifically for the three minutes to talk about this conversation with your client. So for us, this is a two-week-old issue that we knew was bubbling up well before you started to see all the headliners of the Lakers and Shake Shack and Roos Chris and all that, because this information is public information. So the client has to understand uh, exactly what that means in your local community, because it's not that they're going to end up in the Wall Street Journal or CNBC. It's it's the Cranes Journal. It's the local business journal uh, that that will end up to say that, you know, here's a business owner living in this multimillion dollar mansion, and here's four uh, shop owners who went out of business, they couldn't get a loan. Uh, the the, the million-dollar house did. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they don't have it in deserving. The important piece is having that conversation. PR risk is part of enterprise risk management. You as a trusted advisor needs to be having that conversation. I look forward to Jan talking about this later uh, as, as we look at all things. And so we Mark, say from a risk management here. Yep. Yeah, Mark, just want to add, I, I think one thing that we want to do here is we have been talking about this for a few weeks. It is, it's been the news story this week uh, due to, as you said, the Lakers and Shake Shack. But w- we want to make sure that, that we, can, we keep uh, perspective here and balance because overall, and I, I should have mentioned this when I started out, the, the, this program is driving a lot of important business relief uh, to, the business, to the small businesses that have been shut down. Right now, through last night uh, or through today, you were talking about you know 450 billion dollars uh, that has gone through the SBA E-Tran system, over two and a half million small businesses, and what's in the news are just a, a couple of, of instances where maybe right out of the gate uh, some people uh, applied that that shouldn't have. But the majority of these businesses need this business relief. You need to have this trusted advisor discussion with your client. You do need to talk about the PR risk. You, but if they uh, need it, just you know, note uh, why this economic. You know, have them note why this economic uncertainty is justifying it, and this 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 scrutiny will will come um, down, down the road as it's coming now. And it's just it's just appropriate to have that discussion. But what you, what we do need to do is keep keep balance here. Uh, so, Mark, with that, probably we keep keep it going into some some more of the this the you know guidance discussion. Yeah, for sure. And you know, and that's the I think the important thing. And uh, you know, is to remember documentation is key too. I mean, I think for the firm uh, to have the conversation with the client and document that so they re- in case they don't remember you have that documented as to the reason why. There are a lot of great businesses who definitely need this. Uh, but, it, you know, if and when the phone call comes from the local reporter to say, hey, how come you took this loan, uh, that the, your client is well prepared. And it is. It's providing that information to the client. So, uh, you know, looking at the scrutiny, expecting it, just if, if it happens, 
being prepared for it. And there are a and lot of final, great I mean, eligible that, businesses. Yeah, final comment that your client will, will remember that discussion. This is a time of relevance for all of the firms, and they will remember having that discussion with you. For sure. All right, if we go on to the next uh, level of guidance, calculating the maximum amount of loans. On 424, they came out with this FAQ to help with the calculation of the loan amount. I thought this was actually kind of funny because uh, who cares? I mean, we've already been through those calculations. There was nothing really new in that other than if you were questioning whether S-Corp should include K-1 income of the S-Corp owners, definitely not. It was treated like a C-Corp. Uh, on the final rule on uh, seasonal employers, uh, they provided some uh, additional uh, documentation on that as well and how to calculate the 12-week period for that and the eight weeks and, and taking care of all that. If we go on to the next slide, you know, a bunch more FAQs, uh, interim rules. I'm trying to see where we're not. Uh, Eric, if you go to the next slide. Then you have the treasury FAQs, and now it yep. goes on a PPP forgive. Yeah, I got locked up there. Sorry. So, yeah, so uh, the interim final rule uh, issued 428. Treasury FAQs actually add question 39. Still doesn't ask, uh, bring much more into it other than it says, will SBA review individual PPP loan files? The answer is yes. They refer back to uh, the dreaded FAQ number 31, as did uh, FAQ number 37. FAQ 31 is this conversation that's been making a lot of people nervous. So there is a lot of focus around this. There's been talk about audits for those who took over $2 million in, in, in loans, but it's not really an audit the way that we understand audit. There will be some level of review, yes, uh, but not uh, to the extent that we know as CPAs. So again, not a lot new in the in the FAQs that uh, is going to be game changers, but definitely something to keep your eye on. And if we go into the forgiveness update, the next slide, we talk about the forgiveness update. Uh, here, there's been a lot of the recommendations. Eric mentioned this up front. We are making recommendations to Treasury SBA. We sent a document on to them to talk about the eight-week cover period. We met with the, the coalition, our 30-plus coalition partners, to talk about how payroll should be run, what type of reports are they going to expect to provide to support the community and how this all gets run. A lot of them had their loan calculators up front. They are talking about having forgiveness calculators on the back end and getting some of that done. So the eight-week covered period, we made the recommendation to, no matter what the disbursement date, allow it to happen at the beginning of the payroll period, what, immediately preceding or immediately after that disbursement date as one recommendation. A bigger recommendation, understanding the current situation we're in with the stay-at-home order, we said ultimately, you know what? provide flexibility in the process, allow for companies, if they're not allowed to have their employees actually doing something, to wait until the stay-at-home order is lifted for their particular business. Some of your clients are still in operation now. They're essential businesses. They could start the clock now. Other businesses are going to get back online at interim periods, depending on what stage they're in. Our recommendation, we've been talking on the Hill about this, uh, we're trying to get support to make that happen. So, again, all of these, as a reminder, are only our recommendations. These are not set in guidelines yet. We're hoping to get there, but there has been no answer from Treasury or SBA on when those guidelines are coming. Then I think some of the other ones, full-time equivalents, go back and check it. We have it here. You can take support. We're trying to drive consistency with all the payroll companies to do it. And when you don't have hours that are tracked, how else should you be calculating FTEs? And then finally, the, the big one, I think, is, is when you have to do the individual employee calculation, we've gotten a lot of questions to say, well, wait a minute, we have to match the, uh, the quarter prior to uh, eight, February 15th or prior to us getting the money to the eight weeks where we calculated. Well, the quarter is 13 weeks and the, the loan forgiveness is eight weeks, so we're automatically not going to be able to pay as much. Well, we're asking that they allow for an average weekly payroll in that quarter 
against the average weekly payroll of the eight weeks as your comparative, and then you can balance it from there. So in a nutshell, hey, Mark, Eric, I, that's – Yeah, let me just add a couple of comments here. One thing we realize just overall that at times there's frustration – when the guidance hasn't been provided by Treasury. We, we, we identify with, with that frustration. We have that frustration as well. And what we're doing is we're providing suggestions here, uh, having dialogue with them. And related to this forgiveness uh, guidance, they know this is a priority. And Mark's right, we don't have the, the exact timing, but it seems like this is going gonna, gonna to be coming out in the coming days, we were even saying before we got on the call, probably come out like, you know, 8 o'clock on Friday night. Uh, but when it does come out, we will review that uh, in relationship to the recommendations that we've put out and quickly get the information posted to the AICPA Resource Center. But this is helping the process by us um, having this discussion with Treasury. And then we're getting a lot of input from the firm. So your, your input, your questions here today, uh, have helped us uh, drive some of this thinking, so so thanks. And the banking community is right with us on this as well. Everybody wants this forgiveness uh, clarity. So moving on to this broader discussion that we've been having with the firms and with the key stakeholders, it's not just about the PPP program. I mean, the PPP program is huge. Um, you know, at 600, you know, and 60 billion dollars today, uh, there potentially might be more funding needed uh, for PPP. And you know, this current group of, of, of businesses that are receiving loans, the sizes are smaller. Uh, there's lots of discussion of when that's going to run out. Uh, some, some people are beginning to think that it might last a little bit longer. We will see. But with you know, as you look across this chart. Uh, which we'll be leveraging in, in future town halls, you see all the other different options. If it's the EIDL, disaster recovery loans, Jan's going to be talking about the ERC credits. You've got payroll tax deferment. You've got Main Street lending, which is going live uh, tomorrow. And then you've got all these additional relief programs. You've got state programs, local, private grants. More and more private grants are going to be announced. So lots of lots of relief. And this is where, when we talked about this in earlier town halls, you really need to sit down and have that, have that broader uh, advisory discussion uh, with your client. So, Mark, I, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on this, and then we'll, we'll transition this over to Jan. No, I, I do think there's opportunity. And, and keep in mind, just like uh, the struggle with uh, the PPP loan program, the Main Street Lending Program, additional idle funding, you know, guidance is going to be really limited here. It's going to be late. Uh, and I shouldn't, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say late. It'll be as timely as it can be. The problem is these programs are coming out so lightning fast that they can't get the guidance to keep up with it. And so take a look, especially if you have clients that are above the uh, kind of the small business lending or concerned about what the PPP would be from a PR perspective, that Main Street lending program may actually be something to look at. And, you know, and there's a lot of great, uh, you know, the uh, employee retention credit, uh, hearing a lot of things that clients are taking advantage of that. So I'd love to turn it over to Jan and just listen to uh, how she sees all these things. You're welcome, Jan. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much. And And I'll just start off by saying the last three weeks I have been one of the ones of these couple of thousand people out listening to this town hall. Um, haven't posted any Q&As. I figured you guys had enough. But um, I, I do appreciate the AICPA listening to us and, and asking for somebody kind of out on the front lines, local firm, about 50 folks. Um, we, we've lived through this, and we're going to live through it with our clients. And I think as practitioners, we, we hear this um, – from the AICPA and the town halls, and we hear, we understand that we don't have the guidance, and we get that intellectually, but then when the phone doesn't stop ringing and clients are panicked uh, and there's so much noise out there, it is really hard to focus. So uh, we just have a few slides here, especially about the ERTC, but I just wanted to cup. Uh, mention a few things that, that we have been talking with Mark and Eric and, and Lisa and April and, and the folks at the AICPA. Um, can we focus on this as an opportunity? Can we focus on this as let's sit our clients down 
and we're over the rush of, oh, my gosh, I've got to apply for this PPP, uh, we should have had these conversations on the front end, and many of us did. But what, what really is best and what, what type of options are out there? Yes, PPP. We, we've, we've talked that for a few weeks. Uh, but there are other SBA funding options. You know, if you have someone with a rental property or something, no employees, you know, is a disaster loan the right thing? Uh, the employee retention credit that we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, and, and then the payroll tax deferral. Yes, there's interrelations on all of this with with the PPP, and you can't do the payroll tax deferral if you have the PPP, but that could be a true cash flow um, uh, benefit to to clients to defer that payroll tax, but you got to make sure they know on the back end that it's it's a deferral, <laughs> it's not free money, so they're going to have to pay that back over two years. Um, our firm does a lot of payroll tax help and client accounting services. I do think the the FFCRA, the Families First, which it seems like it's been a year ago since that was passed, but you know the payroll tax credits for employee sick pay and, and uh, employee uh, leave, that's critical. It also also has a relation to the PPP forgiveness, um, but those second quarter payroll tax returns are going to be key. Um, and then a couple other items at the bottom. Obviously, we have a five-year carryback for NOLs now. Do we need to look back uh, and, and look at our clients and talk to them? And, and those are going to be complicated. And, and how do we get them filed? And what's best to do for those clients? And, and again, all the focus to keep them with some cash flow. Uh, and then QIP. We've been waiting for that for how long now? And uh, we got our QIP technical correction. How we're going to deal with it is kind of interesting. I think that was last Friday night's um, uh, drop of guidance. I can't remember what day that was. But, you know, do you go back and amend the return or do you run it through 2019 if you haven't filed and do a change of accounting method? Um, so those of us who haven't done 3115s ever since um, the uh, uh, property regs back several years ago, we'll have to figure that out again. But that's what we're here for. So we, we hopefully we can see this as opportunities to look at the different options. Now, specifically, the next couple of slides are about the employee retention credit. I must admit this is probably getting more attention now because of the noise about the PPP. Oh my gosh, maybe I shouldn't have taken this PPP. Maybe I'm not eligible. Maybe it's not PR, whatever the, the best thing. But we still have this employer retention credit. If you did take the PPP and you absolutely positively, your clients needed that, it's the right thing for them and you decide that, then this employer retention, employer retention credit doesn't apply. But let's, let's keep this in our toolbox so that we know what to talk to folks about. We just got some guidance on this yesterday. So none of us are totally up to date on that yet, but I just wanna highlight, it is a, a payroll tax credit for a 50% of qualifying wages, up to $10,000 of wages per employee. So this could be a $5,000 per employee tax credit. Um, now, you've got to make sure you're an eligible employer or your client is an eligible employer. And an eligible employer is any 2020 calendar quarter when you've got either of these two things. Either your operations have been fully or partially suspended as part of a government order. We've got a, a comment on that or you've experienced, the client has experienced a 50% drop in gross receipts when comparing the calendar quarter in 2020 to 2019. Comment on this, this is gonna depend where you are, whether you've been, whether that client has been continued to do business, what part of the country you're in, uh, how, what kind of industry they're in as to how quickly things can come back. You don't wanna miss it if this is key for them, but there could be times that you've got clients that aren't gonna hopefully get to a 50%. So maybe the PPP was the right thing for them. All right, the next slide, I think we've got a little bit more definition on, on the idea of the suspension. A partially suspended is defined as a government imposed restrictions on the business that limits commerce, travel, or group meetings. Um, again, we've got these FAQs. This is not formal guidance. Everything's coming out with FAQs. If you're like me, you need to, you know, have a shortcut on your desktop for that treasury.gov for the PPP part and uh, notice when things are updated. So yesterday we got some frequently asked questions on this. Uh, you do have to look at, uh, and they've got some great examples in there. You do have to look at your control groups and your aggregation um, because it does matter how many employees you have. And again, it, it, you are ineligible if you take out a PPP loan. We've got one more slide on the in, uh, retention credit, just uh, from a really high level standpoint. The, the qualifying wages 
is different um, depending upon how many full-time equivalent employees you have. So you're still going to have to calculate your full-time equivalents. Um, and if the client has less than 100 full-time equivalents, uh, it's all wages, wages and benefits, uh, health care costs, um, during, for those who can, who, including those who continue to work, not just those who cannot work because you're closed. Um, if you have greater than 100 FTEs, it includes all wages, which is wages and employer health care costs um, paid for the time the employee is not providing services due to that full or partial suspense, suspension or more than 50% drop in gross receipts. Um, again, you're going to have to look at the type of industry and the type of employees and the cost um, uh, uh, control group rules and things like that, and definitely look at those FAQs. Um, but the qualifying wages, um, you know, whatever employees you're actually eligible to take, it, it is wages subject to FICA tax, and it is for wages paid after March 12th but continuing through December 31st, 2020. So this is something that we're going to see on payroll tax returns for second, third, and fourth quarter, and particularly for a client that may take a while to get up and running, uh, back up and running and open and back to a good gross receipts. This, this continues until you get up to 80% of comparable gross receipts. Um, it does not include, again, the family or sick leave pay because uh, you've already gotten a payroll tax credit for that. So that's very high level on employer retention credit. Some folks listening would, will think this is the greatest thing, and some folks will say um, that's not for my clients. So, uh, again, we just have to keep it all um, in, in play. And, Jan, I'll just, um, okay, before, uh, before we move to the next slide, just a couple, a couple of quick comments. And thank you for giving us that current review of – of the, that guidance that just came out basically 36 hours ago. But what we're hearing is re related to the PPP and ERC is that mm -hmm. you know, some firms would say private uh, school clients, they've really taken a hard look at this, and a lot of them have decided that the employee retention credit is, is the better program for them than PPP. And then we're hearing uh, from lots of businesses that are, that are larger than 500 uh, that they are going to clearly be, you know, looking to leverage the employee retention credit. So this is something that we will be talking more about. We yeah. actually have a, another webcast in a couple of weeks that's going to dig deeper into it. So thanks for that review. And I'll, move and I'll go ahead and hit on a question. Yeah, and, and Mark, you, you can chime in on this too, but I'll go ahead and hit on the question that we've all heard the last um, couple of days really is what if, the interrelation of the PPP loan, what if on the PPP loan, uh, they, they take it out, they, they return it, uh, okay, now I don't have a PPP loan, so can I take the employer retention credit? Um, we, we feel pretty good if you applied and didn't, didn't get the loan, never signed the loan documents, then you didn't get a PPP loan. Many of us hope and think and, and are, are, are leaning toward if you return it, uh, then you also don't have a PPP loan, so you could take advantage of this, but it is absolutely not clear. We hope to get guidance on that, and I'm not sure if I said that in the politically correct way, Mark, but um, th there could be folks out there that are a little nervous about, okay, I'm giving up my PPP, can I still take this? Yeah, um, and I would say, okay. especially before the safe harbor, uh, Jan, if before May 7th, would make me feel mm -hmm. more comfortable than someone giving back a, a PPP loan after that. But we're going to, Absolutely. I believe, and we can check with our tax team, and you're on the, the tax executive committee, I would think that we would advocate for return the funds, get the credit. But we don't yes. have a definitive answer on that today. Like many things, we don't have definitive answers on. And, and again, I know what it's like to sit out there and, and listen to you know these crazy people on this webcast or are talking about things that I already know. You have the same questions we do. Well, maybe there's some comfort in knowing that 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 we do have some of those questions. But most importantly, there's comfort in that you know that we are working diligently to try to get those answers. Um, so I appreciate that, Mark. Um, my last slide that I was going to cover again goes back to the opportunities, and um, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail. We could talk all day long about different uh, client situations that we have had, um, and April and I have had that conversation. But um, the most th important thing I think I think what Eric and Mark were, were were trying to focus on here with a just lowly practitioner talking is Evaluate the options. Look at each client separately. Look at what they need. Um, many, many people really need this for payroll, and that's it. They need to keep it to stay open. Um, 
then we need the PPP loan. Many folks truly have had other issues. Maybe they need the disaster loan. Whatever the case, what is the best approach? Um, and I will also tag team on what both of you guys have already said earlier about the documentation. We can come in with the details. We're the detail people. We were the detail people on the PPP. We're the detail people on the tax returns. We're the detail people on amended returns. Um, on the documentation, we do need to counsel them to, to keep the documentation for the forgiveness. Whether you're going to get reviewed or not by the SBA, we need to do it right. We need to have the documentation, and we need to have the documentation as to why, you know, why the client needed this. The client needs to have that. And, and yes, we're going to get more guidance on it, but helping them with what expenses qualify. Um, and even if the client hasn't asked, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to reach out to them and say, hey, I know this is crazy. If we can help, let us know, uh, because that's going to benefit everybody in the long run. Um, and then doing some planning, doing some planning to maximize that loan forgiveness. Um, you know, does a client need to have more payroll or uh, and less other costs, or do they need to do something during this eight-week period? Again, once we get more guidance, I think we're the ideal business advisor there to help them with that. And then lastly, that last sentence, um, um, and, and I mentioned this specifically to the FCPA, to, to, to help look beyond the eight weeks. We've been so focused on PPP and so focused on what's happening during this eight-week period. What about if life's not back to normal in eight weeks or whatever that eight weeks ends up being if we get it extended? You know, will our clients be ready to go? Will our clients need time to adjust? What will their cash flow needs be? I was talking to a client about loan covenants yesterday, you know, second, third, and fourth quarter loan covenants. All of these type things, we need to help them look beyond 2020. Uh, but Janet, you thank you for your leadership on the, on the tax executive committee, and you're going to be helping us grant for, for a future event. So what I want to do now is just give a brief update on lender activities. We are talking to the banks every day, and you've all seen the stats, so they are processing lots of loans this week. And what I can tell you about the e-tran system, in the last 24 hours, it is really starting to work much better. So these, these, these applications are flowing, the numbers are being assigned, and, and a lot of community banks are, are finding success, and it's also supporting more and more of the, of the smaller uh, business clients. The fintech lenders, they are up and running. Uh, they are taking new customers. So if you, if you need, we, we, we potentially will be putting on the, our resource center some information related to some of these fintech companies that can support uh, new customers. We know that's been an issue uh, with some firms. And then also the ABA uh, helped us get um, our notice out yeah. about the firm lender uh, relationship. We issued that on Friday. The ABA sent that out to 6,000 bank CEOs uh, that are involved in the lending process. Let's see if there's questions out there before I move to this slide. Lisa, are you out there? Um, Jan, there are a lot of questions around the employee retention credit, but I'll just ask uh, a couple of them. I'll take this one. We've also gotten lots of questions about how self-employed employed loan forgiveness works. And we will have a, a overview summary of it coming out soon. But basically, the, there's a concept called owner compensation replacement that was used in calculating the loan amount for a self-employed individual. And that is the same concept that will be used in the forgiveness calculation. So basically, if, you're, if you have a self-employed client who received a PPP loan, their forgiveness calculation will be based on eight 50 seconds of their 2019 Schedule C net income, 131. And then there are some additional costs similar to other, um, other for, um, allowable uses of the PPP proceeds, such as mortgage interest on business, um, real or personal property, business rent payments on real or personal property, utilities related to the business, et cetera. One big caveat is that the expenses had to have been deducted on the 2019 return 
in order to be eligible for forgiveness in 2020. So again, we'll have a summary coming out on that very quickly, but you can find it now in the interim financial rule that was released on April 14th if you want to go ahead and start digging into that. Dan, are you available for a couple of questions? I'm so sorry. I, I've been so focused to mute my phone because of the background noise. I was talking and I thought no one's listening to me. So I'm so sorry. Um, I know we had a question on the ERTC uh, on the, the affiliation rules, and I was talking. And exactly. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> All right. Um, so, I think, our, you know, go ahead. Nope, you go ahead. Well, the, the question about the affiliation rules and, I, and what I was going to say is I guess I should have read those FAQs more detailed last night uh, because the specific question about SBA affiliation rules, obviously this is a payroll tax credit and there's, there's uh, uh, control group rules and affiliation rules. I do not know if those are the SBA rules or if we're just dealing with the uh, control group. I assume they are the SBA rules, but I have not read those FAQs well enough to know absolutely for sure right now. Okay. Um, let me ask one again, more. That goes, into the, that goes into the computation of more than 100 and less than 100. Again, there are going to be huge companies taking advantage of these employer retention credit. It, that's not the issue. There's, this is not something for just people, you know, less than 500 employees. This, these are, this is different. Um, so, so we're going to see that, um, but, you know, it'll be interesting to, to, to read all of that as it comes through. Great. Thank you. One more quick question. Are TIPS considered wages for the employee retention credit? Yes. Yeah, all compensation. Yeah. What they're okay. talking about there. Right. She, she, uh, she probably will. All right, Eric, do you want me to that. throw it back over to you? All right. We've oh, yeah, got 100 right. questions, so let's, let's keep going. <laughs> um, okay. There was some, we didn't have her direct. Okay, let's just, you know, there. the technical team here, if there's anything you can just keep so Mark and, and Jan on. Let's just drop those additional support lines. Just appreciate that. Um, Regarding the, uh, there's a question that came in on the self-assessment of need, which I think is important. It, it, it said, does, does this new information uh, from Treasury mean an entity receiving a PPP loan is only necessary if they are to go, if they're going to go bankrupt or would cease to exist if they did not receive this loan? I'll, I'll, I'll make a brief comment and pass it to Mark. That, that's not the case. This is not the case of the, the, the PPP loan. You don't have to be going bankrupt or becoming insolvent, uh, but you do need to uh, need the loan um, uh, based on, you know, the, the, your economic circumstances and not have, you know, easy access to other liquidity. So, Mark? Yeah, I mean, that's it, Eric. I mean, when this thing first came out, and this is what we were all trusting, was the fact that their economic uncertainty made it necessary. And the, the, the assumed positive intent, how many times, Eric, have we said that, that the purpose of the loan was to keep people employed. They're trying to keep payroll consistent for these small businesses. So I think ultimately answering that question, uh, economic uncertainty, we would have laid off employees if, uh, and, and so I think there was a strong reliance on this PPP program to be able to do that. You know, we're, we're really encouraging, and Jan did a great job talking about being that trusted advisor. Let's get it documented. Let's have it in the file so that if something comes back uh, later on, we can, we can make that determination. I don't believe Treasury has changed the intent of Congress as, as to what they were trying to do with this program. Uh, but I do think, you know, uh, there are so many businesses that needed this and should apply for it and should be part of this. And then there's a few others that maybe shouldn't have or just hair on fire. They weren't sure what to do up front. And because of the scare of how long the, the funds would last, just went ahead and applied. Uh, you know, so all of that put together. But I think having a logical conversation and getting to the right place is important. It is a great program for those who definitely uh, needed it and kept people on the payroll. And Mark, I'll just I'll just chime in one more thing on that employer retention credit. I, I made the comment, obviously, 
large employers are going to have this credit because it doesn't have the, the same rules. Um, we asked about aggregated groups, and there's a specific uh, question in the FAQs. If you go to irs.gov, um, that's where those were posted. Uh, but don't don't forget this 50% of gross receipts. That's where maybe the aggregation rules might have also apply to. You may have businesses in different industries, and maybe one didn't have a 50% reduction, and one did. So we're going to have to pay attention to that because we've got to measure those that gross receipts to see if they meet to take the credit. Lisa, other questions? There's so many questions coming in. Do you have other kind of uh, summary questions you want to ask us? Let me throw out another question that we've gotten a few times this week and in previous um, calls about the definition of transportation costs as a um, valid use of the loan proceeds. The um, actual act itself does not define transportation costs, but there is an um, interim final rule related to self-employed, so that interim final rule issued on April 14th, that indicates that transportation costs can include fuel that you put in the company vehicle. We don't have any other definitive definitions mm -hmm. included in the guidance, but I just wanted to point that out because we do get lots of questions about that. Yeah, don't we, Lisa, uh, we also get questions about utilities, too. I mean, yeah. you know, not that, not you're, that you're going to throw literally everything and the kitchen sink into the calculation, but I think with some level of prudence and showing that, you know, it's been treated as a utility for the organization uh, is, is positive, uh, I actually think the harder part is going to be making sure on the 75% on the payroll gets covered. Uh, rather than, you know, the, the nickels and dimes of the utilities. And, Mark, that's going to be on a client-by-client -client basis because depending upon whether someone has a big warehouse or lots of debt or high utilities or they have to get their mm -hmm. trash bin, you know, d uh, cleaned out every week, as opposed to a service business that maybe doesn't have, you know, doesn't have a big space. And uh, some that's folks right. are going to have a hard time the 25 percent so well, you got to look at both yep. of those when you're looking at forgiveness for sure Jan I'm going to direct this next question at you and I'm um, not sure if this is catching you off guard or not can you take the sick leave credit due to the stay home order versus a quarantine due to sickness and can you take it for the period prior to having received a PPP loan yes uh, because you you cannot you, those wages it, it's not that you can't take the PPP loan you can take the PPP loan you just those wages cannot be counted in your wages that is meeting the 75 percent test because you're already getting them reimbursed through a payroll tax credit uh, so yes absolutely gotcha that makes sense we've also gotten some questions about um, whether or not in calculating the loan forgiveness, if you don't meet that 75% threshold, is it a cliff or is it simply a reduction in the amount of forgiveness? We are hoping that that will be clarified when additional guidance is released. That's certainly our um, hope that it's not a cliff. It's not an all or nothing. So we will I think keep we're you posted on that. that assumption. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, because again, we keep going and, back know, to the intent of the act, right? And and don't be afraid to talk to clients about you may not make this hundred percent forgivable, and that's okay. I mean, you may have la this is based on last year's payroll. You may have had five more locations last year than you had this year, and twenty more employees. You couldn't fix the amount of the loan, uh, so it may be you know your loan is based on a higher amount. Again, that's the planning part of this to. To, to go through, and if you don't, then will you have a loan, and how are you going to handle that going forward? Yeah, a lot of advisory discussions there. I mean, you, you could have taken a less, a smaller loan amount, or you could you could return some, or you, you turn it into an actual loan. So, I mean, this is a good segue here. I mean, Lisa, I'll come back to you one more time, let you look at the question set. 
Right now, we're That's talking in detail here about you know all the forgiveness you know clarifications we're looking for, you know, looking for more guidance from from Treasury. We're also talking about some of the new pro, newer programs, ERC, which just released guidance this week, and they're, they're foggy. They're foggy clarifications needed. But if you look at how far we've come from even just the application phase, I remember the first town hall, and we were talking about the the el, you know eligibility for PPP. We were talking about the document set. We were talking about how to do the loan calculation, and we've gotten our arms around all of that. And there's still some you know some additional minor clarifications that are coming out that Mark referenced. Uh, but we 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 have a good understanding right now on the whole application process, which which makes sense. And we're going to get our arms around this forgiveness process. So when you look at this defining time for all of us, I think every, all the firms here have done a great job. We've heard from so many firms about how they've taken care of employee safety, how their business operations are, are, are going well as possible. Uh, they, they've been preparing uh, to work in this type of remote environment for a while, so those investments are paying off. And everybody knows that the firms are playing such a critical role in helping uh, support the economy by keeping these businesses going. Uh, this is a time that the clients are going to really uh, look back on. Uh, they're going to remember their firms for how they stood up and helped them, provided this judgment as, as Jan is doing for her clients. And also, we all need to keep uh, aware of the pace uh, that, that's occurring and our ability to be nimble. That's one thing that we're thinking about here at the AICPA is being nimble, addressing the latest guidance, having discussions with the government officials, with the payroll processors, with the banks. We've got to collaborate. We have to collaborate. We have to team. We're collaborating with these different groups, um, having you know, good, frank discussions with them. And then what we're seeing is that this is actually going to position the profession for increasing value. And one thing that we've been saying in some of our, our discussions with firms and solution providers is, you know, 2025 has become 2020. Everything's gotten accelerated. The use of some tools has gotten accelerated. And it's, that's creating some anxiety. Uh, but with that, there's opportunity. And we are actually very well positioned uh, to do a lot more. We're going to talk about some of this tomorrow. We've got a we've got a webcast that is not going to be talking about PPP and the CARES Act. It's actually going to be talking about, you know, how do you manage uh, what's going on here, you know, the different uh, planning horizons, and what does this black swan event, this pandemic, really mean for firms, and and how are firms going to you make the best of this. Uh, to support their business as well as uh, their clients' business. So you can find information on that at digitalcpa.com. We also have this resource center that Lisa Simpson and Mark Koziel and, and the whole team uh, uh, work so hard at updating. They, they do updates every single day. Um, this is one of the t most visited pages uh, on AICPA.org now. Um, please do you know, check uh, in on it regularly to make sure you've got the latest recommendations and the latest guidance. I don't know, Lisa, if there's anything you want to add here, and I'll also just pause to see if there's another question that's come up that you want us to address. One other question came up about how, how to book the loan, um, a PPP loan. We have a specific resource center around a a issues for COVID-19. And um, we can include that in the answer to the questions, but we'll actually um, also include that on our slides next time. But you can search for yeah, Lisa, ANA COVID. Go ahead. Yeah, Lisa. Um, so that is something that I don't think is still well defined, uh, but is definitely something that we are looking at internally with the highest level of our ANA people on top of this. Uh, so to your point of where the guidance will be once it's resolved, uh, we, we had great debate over that last evening. So uh, it's not quite settled, but it will be so. I think that's it for the questions. Thanks, Lisa. We also have a tax resource center which talks about many of the things that Jan discussed and Mark and I also discussed with that broad chart. 
Uh, we will continue to talk about those during these town hall updates, and you can receive the latest information at, at this URL. So what's coming up next? We are going to have our fifth uh, town hall next Thursday at 3 p.m., uh, May 7th. Uh, the link to register is up now, so you, you can register for it. Uh, we apologize for a little bit of the audio issues here today. We'll make sure that doesn't occur uh, next week. And uh, we really do value this time with you. This is very useful for us to receive all these questions. Uh, we, we do look at them and we leverage them uh, related to what we're going to be putting in, into the Resource Center. We also are going to have another more technical uh, webcast talking about FF, the differences in interaction between FFCRA and CARES, and that will be on May 13th. We'll give you more information about that next week. So I just want to thank Mark Koziel, uh and his team and uh, for all they're doing, and Mark, for your, your uh, remarks today. So thanks, Mark. Thanks, sir. And Jan, thank you very much for all that you're doing and for participating in, in today's webcast. Thank you. So we hope all of you stay well and safe. Uh, we look forward to uh, speaking with you next week. Um, or in the meantime, feel free to reach out to us electronically. One thing that we're really leveraging is social media. Uh, you can look at you know, my and Mark's uh, Twitter feeds, the ICPA Twitter feed, and we almost on a daily basis are putting out any information uh, through those social media avenues. So that's all for now. Thank you very much. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Bye.